but thinking about inotropes as opposed to just norepi, if you're used to thinking about norepi. Kids are more likely to need hydrocortisone, and then in children we have the option of ECMO for refractory shock. And this is, I think it's in your slides, it may be too small in your slides to read. Um, just one thing to point out here is that dopamine is not even on the American College of Critical Care Medicine guidelines. Um, I'm not saying don't use dopamine. Use dopamine because it's what you have available. Um, use dopamine because it's what you're used to using and what you're comfortable with. But know that sometimes children need more. And it's actually okay to start with something like epi or no epi. <coughs> All right, and then neonates, children are different than adults, and uh, neonates are also different than children in general. So the differential for a septic neonate, so sepsis, 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 we always talk about sepsis, mm -hmm. and sepsis is always one, two, and three on your differential. But in neonates, you're gonna think about sepsis automatically, but make sure you try to think about these other things as well, um, because neonates are at risk for them. So inborn error, metabolism, Cardiogenic shock, so the PDA might be closing in the first uh, few days to first couple weeks of life. Uh, so, uh, critical coarctation, a, um, a transposition that needs the PDA to actually give oxygenated blood, or a hypoplastic left heart, where you need your PDA to deliver any systemic. Um, uh, blood flow, you need your PDA and your right heart to deliver that, so your poorly perfused unit is about cardiogenic shock. So there's a little error in your slide, so persistent pulmonary hypertension, so um, neonates who are hypoxic, sorry, neonates who are either hypoxic or acidotic, um, the vasculature in the lungs is more susceptible to becoming kind of vaso more vasoconstricted in anyone, but um, units um, in particular. And so that may be more likely to actually pop open there because they have increased pulmonary vascular resistance and actually pop open their PDA and cause right to left shunt. Um, I think your slides say left to right shunt um, and cause poor oxygen delivery because you're delivering poorly oxygenated blood to the systemic circulation. And then something endocrine like congenital adrenal hyper hyperplasia. All right, so back to our case. Any questions about uh, the neonate and the child and how they're different in terms of management? <coughs> so we've said this four-year-old who's had four or five days of vomiting, abdominal pain, poor PO intake, who's lethargic and had flash cap refill mm -hmm. in annex, um, he was severely septic. So we gave 20 cc per kilo and just 50, and we, he was actually in back when he got this. I probably should have moved him up front now that I prepare this talk. Um, and very quickly, his urinalysis returned positive. But with the, with the fluids and with the antibiotics, his mentation improved, his perfusion improved. I got a little more history from the parents that actually, you know, when I, when I met the child and noticed that he was lethargic, they noted that he'd been like this intermittently at home, and it was probably with his fever, but it was a little more than that. Um, so he was admitted for IV antibiotics and ongoing resuscitation. And ultimately ended up having, this is not what I expected in a four-year-old, but a multi-drug resistant E. coli, um, both urosepsis and both hilo and bacteremia, and then he had an obstructing stone. So it wasn't actually sensitive to the ceftriaxone that I gave him, because was multi-drug resistant, but he looked that much better with just fluids. All right. So we've talked about kind of guidelines and definitions, and how do we recognize shock early, um, and how do we manage shock quickly and reverse shock quickly? Um, but what are the barriers and how can we overcome them? So this is a um, study of deaths when, when management of shock went wrong over six years in a couple county districts in France. Um, and they looked at kind of what types, like what were the problems with care and what types of errors happened in these children. <coughs> And it was with confidential surveys. And in the end, you know, there was a subset of patients who had delayed um, um, seeking of medical treatment. Um, there was a good amount of delay in administering proper treatment. So that included antibiotics and fluids. 
There was insufficient amount of fluids, uh, failure to redose fluids, um, and then overall kind of underestimating the severity of illness. And it's difficult for kids um, because we have such a high N <coughs> of febrile tachycardic children. So just kind of honing in on some of these. Uh, so signs of pre-shock, so your severe sepsis um, not being taken into account. And remember, you don't need to be hypotensive to have shock. So in children who have or poorly perfusion don't respond to 40 cc's per kilo, they're in shock. Um, Inadequate fluids, error in dosing antibiotics, not giving antibiotics to children with purpura, um, those are things that we'd all recognize. Um, delayed fluids, it's easy to delay fluids, it's easy to delay antibiotics if you don't have the right systems in place um, to get those things done, and if, you, if you're not recognizing things. So similarly, this is a retrospective chart review of 90 patients who had severe sepsis and septic shock, and they, they looked prospectively at the barriers to septic shock treatment. And these were kind of the pitfalls, pitfalls that they faced. Um, so you can see in this chart that um, those who got less than 20 per kilo in the first hour had 73% mortality in these, among these 90 patients. And those who got greater than 40 in the first hour, had 33% mortality. So inadequate fluid resuscitation is one of the pitfalls. And then delayed fluid resuscitation. So you can see here that those who got um, their fluids, this was, I'm not actually sure how much fluids this one, it's 40 per kilo, um, did not get fluids within 60 minutes had 73% mortality and 40% mortality if they got their fluids within 30 minutes. So this is some data that supports kind of even getting fluids in before 15 minutes is better than getting fluids in before an hour. So the, the barriers that they found in this study that led to, um, that were, made it difficult to implement guidelines and to take care of patients with septic, sepsis were um, not having vascular access. These are themes that won't kind of um, come up a few times. Lack of recognition of early shock, not having enough healthcare providers to take care of the patient, um, and then not having guidelines and not, or not using guidelines. So this is a quality improvement study out of Boston Children's, where this is kind of their, their baseline study. <coughs> where they were looking at their adherence to PAL and the surviving sepsis guidelines. And they found that they actually had really poor compliance. So you can see here, those who got adequate um, fluid resuscitation, so 60s per kilo, and were started on antitropes within the first hour, were about 60, um, sorry, were about 35-ish percent. Um, and overall, their adherence to the bundle, so getting all of these things, so recognizing, getting vascular access quickly, giving fluid antibiotics and inotropes in those who needed it, um, was about 19%. And then they kind of looked stepwise at kind of why was um, adherence so low. And you can kind of see here that in order to be able to give fluids quickly, in order to be able to give 60 per kilo in the first hour, you need to have IV access in five minutes, or, and, or you, need to have, you need to recognize sepsis in those first five minutes. And so you can see here that no patients who neither had recognition in the first five minutes or vascular access in the first five minutes, so those are the dark gray, or the, sorry, the, uh, yeah, the dark brain. When you're kind of following that chart down, none of those patients um, ended up getting IV fluids in the first 60 minutes. So each step relies on the prior step. So this kind of emphasized how important um, those first five minutes can be. So here at CHO, um, we did some focus groups to identify our own um, barriers that we thought. So the MDs, um, had a general, 
a general unfamiliarity. So this was physicians and nurses in the QDD wards um, and beyond. Um, some time-sensitive strategies were delayed because of um, limited resource availability. Uh, so that's IV access, um, this unwillingness to advance to IO access. Concern that rapid flu administration may result in a pulmonary edema or loss of the IV. Hesitation to start basal active inotropes in your peripheral IVs and difficulty recognizing the shot. So these are things that are not just ours. Um, as doctors, they're also pretty similar among the nurses. So nurses similarly felt a dis this sense of discomfort around placing IOs and also pushing fluids rapidly or by hands. And this concern about um, losing an IV. We work so hard to get an IV. Um, losing it may be harmful to patients. Uh, that's definitely true. But getting those fluids in quickly is what's saving the patient's life. And so um, all of this is a discussion with every patient and getting the appropriate access is definitely important. And then delays, there's lots of delays, getting the meds from pharmacy, waiting for the physicians to make their decisions, waiting for the labs, searching for IV equipment, um, and recognizing shock again. So how do we overcome those barriers? Uh, this is Baylor. Um, they established um, a computerized triage system that helped them recognize sepsis, so it alarmed the triage uh, nurse, and the nurse was able to activate um, a sepsis kind of protocol for that patient. Um, so those patients who were toxic appearing or were high risk of, of invasive infection were placed immediately from recess into a resuscitation room, which happened just the other day um, in our hospital. And then in order to facilitate timely delivery of interventions and nursing respiratory therapy, additional personnel, so respiratory therapy, additional nurses, pharmacy were recruited to that room once this kind of tr uh, triage trigger uh, order was triggered. And so you can see that after doing this, and this seems overly ideal to me, their findings, but um, this is time to first bolus, kind of they're all over the place, as high as over 300 minutes, um, and they get down to at least less than 50 minutes on, on average. Um, after they implement time to third bill list. Similarly, they're getting at least within, it looks like, um, 80 minutes or so, 70 to 80 minutes. For most of the patients and time to antibiotics got a lot faster as well. So at Boston Children's, um, they were able to achieve, where we looked at those study from 2012 where they had only 19% adherence up front um, with the whole bundle. They were able to achieve 100% um, adherence and a big part of their um, success, in addition to education and increased recognition, was this thing in their electronic medical record where um, um, it could be, it was called firing the bolt. And so basically, this lightning bolt would appear next to the patient um, once an order set for sepsis was used, so whether that's in triage or by the ordered physician. Um, and so this bolt would pop up on everyone's screen when you're looking at your computer and would notify nurses, would notify the charge nurse, would notify the pharmacy that this patient is in septic shock, they're going to need their meds quickly, they're going to need additional nurses, your charge nurse is going to go over there, and you can see that that took them, this fire the bolt, um, uh, took them kind of, and getting those additional resources um, at bedside quickly um, took them to better um, adherence. So what do we do here at CHO? We have our um, recognition tool here, um, looking at SIRS, sepsis, and organ dysfunction, and septic shock, and our normal vital signs. Uh, we have a clinical practice guideline. You'll notice that it includes giving fluids as quickly as 15 minutes in that second uh, red zone here. Our best practice advisory will pop up. This is currently not as useful in the emergency department because unless you're hypotensive, it doesn't pop up because it relies upon um, these end organ dysfunction symptoms which aren't actually um, uh, chartable from triage, as far as I understand, um, like capillary refill, mental status. And then we have an order set. All right, so take home points. So remember that children with a normal blood pressure can still be 
profound, be in profound shock. Their heart rate increases a lot. Their systemic vascular resistance increases a lot. They might not be hypotensive, but they may be about to be hypotensive and dead. Um, so remember, they don't have to be hypotensive. So abnormal mental status and perfusion, consider severe sepsis. Use that pediatric assessment triangle. And you can judge a patient from across the room. So children are more hypoglycemic and are more sensitive to the cardiotoxic cytokines, so tend to present in cold septic shock as opposed to adults. So this means that they're more likely to need more fluids and actually likely to need inotropes like epi and dopa as opposed to more epi. Fluids can be given, can and should be given early and quickly, as quickly as 15 minutes, and you stop if they develop signs of pulmonary edema. We're using ultrasound at bedside a bit to help us with this as well. Um, looking at the IVC, looking at the lungs, um, but your clinical exam is um, the gold standard here. Um, reversing septic shock quickly, you'll save a life. If you haven't, I'm sure you have already. Um, and the big thing here is we need resources to be able to beat sepsis. And so um, I'll just call out Sam here. He was definitely calling out resources the other day when we had a patient with septic shock, uh, asking for help. Um, Having three nurses in the room um, got that patient better um, that we had the other day. Right. Thank you to these folks, and thank you all for your attention.